you for downloading Higher Rights Presentation, Maintaining Compliance, Employment Screening, Legislative Update. My name is Rod Flegel, and I'll be your presenter along with my colleague Jennifer Mora. Jennifer and I are both attorneys at Littler Mendelssohn, the, co the country's largest exclusively labor and employment law firm, and in particular, we practice um, spending a great deal of time dealing with the laws that intersect concerning background checks. So all the things that you may be hearing about in, in the news uh, or on blogs, that's what we spend a good part of our lives day in, day out doing, and we're, we're not simply lawyers who saw something interesting in a, uh, the newspaper or something and are here to tell you about it. Um, I'm a shareholder at, at Liver Mendelssohn, and I've been focusing on this area uh, for a great many years, and so what we hope to do is, is run through the updates with you on what's going on in the legal landscape and also give you some practical pointers that come from our experience actually doing this so much as opposed to just picking something out of a, out of a book. As a reminder, um, <clears throat> this is an informational presentation, and if you do come up with questions, uh, we'd invite them to run them Run, have you run them by your own legal counsel. And just so you know, uh, today we won't be doing any question and answers because this is a recorded presentation. So with all of that said, let's talk about where we're going to go today so you can see the roadmap of what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to cover the federal law update. We're going to spend some time talking about the guidance that the EEOC released on how and when employers can use criminal records. We're going to also talk about what's going on at the state law level. Um, our higher right representative is going to give you some information about how higher right makes valuable compliance information available to you. And then we will cover some final thoughts at the end of the presentation. So let's jump right in here with the federal law update because there's plenty of things going on. And of course, federal law is important because no matter where you are, in the United States, the federal law is going to apply, whereas the state law that we're going to talk about may or may not apply to your operation depending on where you hire from and do business. So as a wise man once said, we live in interesting times, and one of the things that's uh, really come up as important for you to know about is the spike in class action filings against employers under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, when I started practicing, the Fair Credit Reporting Act was something that really the credit bureaus, like Experian, TransUnion, they had to be concerned about. Uh, but it wasn't so much unemployment law, and employers generally knew about it, uh, but it wasn't something where there was actual litigation risk, except in very rare exceptions. So we've really seen uh, a significant emphasis on class actions, especially the last 18 to 24 months. and so. There are plaintiff's lawyers out there trying to make hay filing these FCRA class actions and actually getting them certified occasionally. And so <clears throat> that's one of the things you really want to be mindful of in terms of looking at compliance opportunities in your organization. Uh, the third bullet point talks here about the FTC Summary of Rights. And many of you may be familiar with that. It's something the government publishes, uh, the, the Federal Trade Commission, to be Specific, and you include that with what most of you will call or know as the pre-adverse action letter. Um, now the FTC has been joined by uh, a new bureau called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and so the summary of rights will apparently be uh, updated effective uh, the beginning of next year, and so you'll want to make sure that you are getting a hold of and using the most recent form. The changes appear to be very minimal, but it's always the best practice to make sure that your paperwork is current. The other thing that was coming up at the federal level and specific to the Fair Credit Reporting Act is the staff report that the FTC attorneys issued. And um, some of the oversight of the Fair Credit Reporting Act is shifting over to the new bureau. And so I think as uh, government agencies will sometimes do when they're in competition with each other, the FTC wanted to make sure its stamp was on the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and they issued um, a, a report that basically summarized the state of the law and consolidated a lot of advisory opinion letters and the like that they had issued over the years. 
And so it covered some of the very basic points, and, and one of them, of course, is that the Fair Credit Reporting Act is not limited to credit reports in, in the classic sense of the term, even though the name of the statute refers to um, credit. And it will cover basically any type of information that you get from a background check company like HireRight. Now, in the report, there were a couple of things that the FTC staff emphasized, and uh, these are important points to keep in mind in looking for compliance opportunities in your organization. One of them is to make sure that you've got a standalone background check consent form and you're not relying on a consent blurb in an employment application or some other document. Um, the other thing is that adverse action, uh, which means taking a decision that negatively impacts either an applicant, which classically would be rejecting them or deferring their application, or an employee in terms of firing them or denying a transfer or promotion, um, those sort of actions when the decision is based even in part on information in a background check report trigger this obligation that employers have to issue what we call the adverse action notices. And so the FTC reminds us that in its view, this concept of adverse action is very broad and, and it shouldn't be viewed as limited to just rejecting job applicants. So if you use background check reports in other than your pre-employment process, there may be an opportunity to uh, fortify your compliance. The FTC also talked about the waiting period between what we call the pre-adverse action letter and the adverse action letter reminded that uh, until you have served the waiting period, you shouldn't be sending out the adverse action notice, the second of the two. Um, the FTC also said uh, in its view that we shouldn't limit our thinking to just job applicants and employees, but may have to start thinking about the many other folks who can be uh, involved in your workforce, including contractors and volunteers. Now, nothing I'm saying uh, necessarily should be construed as agreeing with the FTC position. This is an advisory document, but it is important to know for many reasons where the government stands on these issues, uh, just like with the EOC. It's not the law, but it's the view of the agency that enforces the law, and some courts will what they call defer to the agency's opinion. Now, one of the other things about the staff report is it didn't answer some of the questions that probably a lot of us um, who, who spend time dealing with background checks would have liked them to at least give us their opinion on. One is they didn't talk about how the FCRA rules for employers work together with online application um, tools or procedures, which is something that many, many companies are now moving towards or regularly using. So there's some gray area there, and it comes up with things like can you get a signature electronically or can you email the notices and the like. And so they didn't um, bring clarity to an area of the law that would have helped their guidance be more uh, useful and more contemporary. The other thing is that they did not specify the, the waiting period that I already talked about between the two letters, and it would have been nice for them to give us some guidance uh, in their view, and so we're left with the handful of court decisions, none of them definitive, because the only definitive source of authority uh, for a federal law is the U.S. Supreme Court, saying that you, should, you do have to wait a reasonable amount of time between the two letters and that uh, these courts have viewed five business days as, as the standard that really most employers should look to meet. Now, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jen. Jen, tell right. us about Ban the Box. Thank you, Rod. As some of you may know, there is a growing movement across the nation to prohibit employers from asking applicants about their criminal records on employment applications. And as we'll discuss later during this program, employers in Massachusetts, Hawaii, and the city of Philadelphia are expressly prohibited from requesting criminal history information on an application. Federal legislation, which was introduced on July 26th, would make it unlawful for employers in all states to ask job applicants whether they have ever been convicted of a crime until after a conditional offer of employment is made, except in limited circumstances. The measure would permit such questions only after a conditional offer for employment has been made or where offering the applicant the position before a criminal background check is conducted, quote unquote, may involve an unreasonable risk to the safety of specific individuals or to the general public. Now, the bill would also direct the EEOC to issue regulations defining the categories of employment applicable to the limited exceptions, 
and to also set out the factors that employers would consider or would need to consider in assessing whether an individual's past criminal history poses an unreasonable risk. Aggrieved job, applic job applicants would be able to take advantage of the same rights and remedies offered to them under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Now, based on our insiders, Based on our inside information, it appears this bill is not expected to advance this year, but it is definitely something that employers will want to watch. The next slide, which focuses on immigration, Senate approved a bill that would extend four key immigration provisions, one of it which would extend E-Verify currently set to expire September 30th of 2012 to September 30th, 2015. The bill is now pending before the House for consideration. E-Verify is an internet-based system that compares information from an employee's I-9 form to data from federal agencies like the Department of Homeland Security to confirm employment eligibility. And while participation in E-Verify is voluntary for most businesses, some companies may be required by state law or federal regulation to use E-Verify. For example, most employers in Arizona and Mississippi are required to use E-Verify, and it is also mandatory for employers with federal contracts or subcontracts that contain the Federal Acquisition Regulation E-Verify Clause. Next, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services recently published a notice that employers should continue using the current version of Form I-9 beyond the form's expiration date of August 30, 2012 until it publishes a final revised Form I-9. Um, the U.S. CIS is now reviewing public comments received from its March 27, 2012 proposed revision of the Form I-9. The draft of the proposed form includes some significant changes, such as expanding the one-page form to two pages. Additional fields are added, requesting more employee data, data such as optional fields for employee for email and a telephone number. The proposed form also requires the employee to provide his or her foreign passport number and country of issuance if the employee was issued an I-94 at an airport or land border. border. Finally, in June 2012, in a five to three decision, the Supreme Court struck down a significant part of the Arizona immigration law on the grounds that those provisions were preempted by federal law. One invalidated section was the provision making a state crime for an unauthorized worker to apply for work or be employed in the state. The court also struck down the provision which criminalized an alien's failure to apply for and carry an alien registration document. And it, the court also invalidated the provision that authorizes warrantless searches, sorry, arrests, if the action was based on probable cause that the individual had committed a public offense that would render them deportable. The court, however, concluded that it was premature to strike down the provision that requires state law enforcement officers to verify the immigration status of every person stopped, arrested, or detained if the officer has a reasonable suspicion that the individual is unlawfully in the U.S. The court reasoned that it was improper to enjoin that section before the state courts had an opportunity to construe it and without some showing that enforcement of the provision, in fact, conflicts with federal immigration law and its objectives. On the next slide, this will just wrap up the federal update. It's crucial for employers to ensure compliance with the federal FCRA and state fair credit reporting laws in which the employers operate. As Rob mentioned, we are seeing a spike in class action claims filed against employers for what most would consider to be very minor technicalities. Now, whether your hiring is done on a centralized or a decentralized basis, um, employers should consider periodic audits to ensure that processes are being followed and potentially revise existing forms in light of any new fair credit reporting laws or amendments to existing laws. And although the existing I-9 can still be used, employers must monitor the USCIS website or other blogs and news channels for release of the updated I-9. Finally, although our insiders do not expect much movement on the federal ban the box legislation this year, passage of this act would be a major development, so employers will want to be tracking that particular piece of legislation as well. And now Rod will talk about the new EEOC guidance on criminal records. Thanks, Jen. And so the EEOC guidance came out in April, and we've had a couple of months now to let it marinate. Um, and it's important to understand where the EEOC is with this because uh, as much as I relish doing Fair Credit Reporting Act work uh, throughout the day, I also uh, day in, day out deal with EEOC charges and lawsuits 
Uh, and I can tell you from my practical experience that the EOC is out there chasing lots of employers around in these very sweeping systemic investigations where they want tons of information and it can be a real pain, although um, you can beat them back and we've been successful in uh, having them dismiss claims against our clients. So I say that so you know it's kind of a cautionary note that this is out there and it's a real thing, but it's not necessarily a doomsday if the EOC does want to talk with you about your background check program. So let's talk about exactly what this advisory guidance uh, has to say. The focus of the EOC's guidance is really on what's called disparate impact, which means you have a policy which isn't necessarily intended to exclude uh, protected class members, but in its application does. So the difference is no one's in a disparate impact case is talking about uh, whether there was some racist intent or the like. It's really just the effect of what can be a, a policy that applies to everyone in an even-handed way. It's just that as applied, it's going to exclude some folks more, more than others. That's the essence of disparate impact. Now, what the EEOC said is that uh, to mitigate against the risk that your program will have a disparate impact, as a starting point, you shouldn't have a blanket disqualification of anyone with a criminal record. And as one of the commissioners put it at one of the public hearings before the EEOC came out with this, uh, she said, we look for the employers that have the blanket policies and we sue them. So uh, if you're doing that, it's a good idea to maybe revisit uh, if that's the right tool for your organization to use in screening. Now, what they want you to do is have a screen that is tailored, or what they say targeted for the particular job and the particular uh, setting that the job will be performed in that looks at how old the crime is and other factors. And the idea is that um, before you reject someone with a criminal record, you'll take other factors into account as opposed to just having kind of a what the EEOC views as a knee-jerk reaction to someone having a criminal record. Um, in terms of having a flat ban, in other words, if you have this crime within this number of years or at all, you can't work here, the EEOC says in its view that flat ban is or should be reserved unless there's what they call the demonstrably tight nexus, which you know is kind of mumbo jumbo in my view, but essentially what I think they're after is to say, um, if you're gonna reject someone with a criminal record without even looking at some of the other information we're telling you you should, um, it better be because in the particular job with the particular criminal background, you can't really afford to take any risk that the person might go on to commit more crime. That's, that's the best I can do to put that particular standard in plain English. So the thing you're going to want to be thinking about there is if you have some crimes that are automatic disqualifiers, the compliance opportunity is to take a look and think, um, are you really prepared to stand behind those, either because of business interests or be, um, because you're confident that you can make your case to the EEOC should they knock at your door. The EEOC also has told us, and it was interesting because in telling us their best practice recommendations, they pretty much are understanding employers have legitimate uses for criminal records in the hiring and employment process, and, and they've given us some suggestions about how, in again, their view, you might go about doing this. And so they say, you, you know, don't pick any crime of any kind, but be more uh, narrow in your thinking about which crimes actually relate to the jobs that you're hiring for and have a policy that captures kind of that more uh, narrow thinking about how criminal information or a prior criminal record impacts employment opportunities with your organization. Then they say, you know, don't keep it a secret. Make sure the folks uh, in your business understand the policies and who's supposed to be doing what so you don't have people talking out of school. And, you know, I had to call this morning with uh, a government agency where these sorts of things can come up. And the person I was talking to told me, I've talked to your managers, and they all say you have a no felony rule at this company, uh, whereupon I started to disabuse them of that notion because uh, it's not true. But the immediately I contacted the client to say, hey, you know, you may need to talk to some of your folks in the field who are not quite understanding the policy because, you know, first of all, they're engaging with government, inter 
officials talking about stuff they probably shouldn't be without telling the legal department. Second of all, they absolutely have it wrong at a time when it can be costly to get it wrong in terms of how you do use criminal information in your process. Then they say keep the information confidential, and that's not rocket science. You know, The idea is if you're uh, going to consider bringing folks into your organization to have a criminal record, you don't want to relegate them to being second-class citizens because everyone happens to know about that. And there's a lot of ways to set up your program um, so that the information really is only available to those who have a reason to know about it. So in terms of looking at how you can reduce your Title VII risk at a time when we're not only seeing the class actions, but we're also seeing uh, a lot of activity from um, the EEOC and from the plaintiff's bar who are starting to uh, or continuing the, the trickle of class actions, uh, private class actions claiming racial discrimination based on the use of uh, credit or criminal information. Here's some ideas. So take a look at your policy and um, well, I will never say do necessarily what the EEOC tells you. It is kind of a useful baseline if you're looking at the, the compliance opportunities from the perspective of reducing your Title VII risk uh, about how would your or how does your program compare to what the EEOC is suggesting. And then there are also opportunities to look at whether your program is strategic. And so what do I mean by that? The, the simplest analogy is to think about it like this. In, in a disparate impact case, if you're if you think of the risk, it's those protected class members that you've excluded because of their criminal or, in some cases, credit information. And you can kind of think of each person you reject for that reason is blowing up the balloon with air. And the bigger the balloon, potentially the greater your disparate impact risk. So how do you keep from blowing up the balloon in the first place? That's where the strategy comes into play. And there's different approaches, but one of them is to simply think about if you can sequence the information you're considering so that you put the criminal and the credit information later in the process. So yesterday, Jen and I were talking with an employer about their screening program, and they get motor vehicle records in addition to the criminal. So we talked about, look, can you look at the motor vehicle records, which might disqualify someone right off the bat, before you even get to the criminal information? And there's a, there's a lot of different opportunities to do things like that and, and apply good strategic principles to helping to mitigate any Title VII risk that your organization may have. The other thing is to take a look at your program materials. Uh, Jen and I you know, regularly look at these for employers, and there's some simple suggestions about how to make them better exhibits, how to make them clearer, and it's really worth looking at those as exhibits now, You know, given that if you answer an EEOC charge, for example, you're going to be producing some of this stuff as exhibits, and you can, knowing that, prepare your materials so they come across the right way and, and emphasize the right points. Um, as we talked about, it's important to do your education and training, and you may look for opportunities to, to do that as well. Record keeping is important, and there's also a strategy you can bring to bear there. So, for example, as you go through making your hiring decisions, um, how is the data stored, and is there some way to code the decisions? So if you have to do any program analytics, like if you were assessing how many people had been rejected because of their criminal records or because of their motor vehicle records, is there some way to sort that out without having to go through thousands of files or hundreds of files and, and trying to reverse engineer the decision? Uh, and then the final point, as we talked about, is maintaining the confidentiality, which of all this is probably the easiest. And then there's the litmus test. Um, I've had the opportunity to represent clients in front of the EEOC, with the New York Attorney General, with the NAACP, and putting aside kind of the legalese that gets into this, because um, we could talk about alphabet soup going from FCRA to EEOC to CFPB, at some level, you want to be able to think about your program from how you would present it to an agency or a court that was reviewing it. And there are ways to, to just have your program be described and to configure it to get across the point that you're trying to fairly balance the many legitimate interests that your company has in trying to keep out ex-criminals uh, and trying to give people a fair shake. And so you can think about how would the program describe if you stripped away the alphabet soup and, and just were telling someone how it worked, uh, would they get the point that you really do try to be fair uh, from an advocacy standpoint? Because as much as I do advice and counsel, I do a lot of litigation. 
I think that's a really useful way to, for you to think about your, your program in addition to some of the other technical points uh, and opportunities that we've already talked about. So with that, let me turn this over to Jen, who's going to tell you uh, what's going on at the state law level. Thanks, Rod. Um, we've talked a lot about Title VII, the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Statute, but it is important to note that many states like California, for example, have their own EEOC statutes that act as counterparts to Title VII. And there also are states that provide specific protections for ex-offenders. For example, New York requires employers to post notices and also inform applicants and employees when they receive a background check report that contains conviction information, even if the conviction will not result in an applicant being disqualified from the position. Sequencing restrictions refer to when an employer can ask specific questions. Examples of this type of restriction can be found in Massachusetts and Hawaii, where employers cannot elicit criminal information on an employment application, but must wait until after a conditional offer of employment has been made. Next, there's inquiry restrictions, which define what information an employer can request from applicants or employees. There are a number of states that contain these restrictions. And so for nationwide applications, you might see a lot of disclaimers notifying applicants that they don't have to provide certain information. So for example, in California, employers are prohibited from asking about certain petty marijuana offenses. And in Massachusetts, even if the employer does ask about criminal history information after a conditional offer has been made, the employer is further restricted insofar as it, for example, can't ask about first-time misdemeanor convictions for certain offenses like drunkenness, simple assault, or speeding. There also are what we call source restrictions, which regulate the types of information that employers cannot access. An example of this is separate laws in California and Nevada, which prohibit employers from using the state sex offender registry website for employment purposes. There have been some cases in California that have addressed the California restriction, but the bottom line is that employers generally have to be mindful of these types of laws in other states that might restrict the use of certain sources. And finally, along the same lines as the EEOC's guidance on criminal records and policy statements regarding credit reports, credit records, many states have similar job relatedness requirements. And what this means is that in some states, employers cannot rely on criminal history information or credit reports for employment purposes unless you can demonstrate that use of the information is related to the specific job in question. So while you'll have to consider the EEOC's guidance, you'll also have to consider any job relatedness requirements in the states in which you operate. The next slide talks about the growing trend across the nation to restrict the use of credit reports for employment purposes. Currently on the books are credit check laws in California, Oregon, Washington, Connecticut, Maryland, Illinois, and Hawaii, with the most recent being in Vermont. Now, although the, statute, the states are similar because they regulate the use of credit reports for employment purposes, all of them say very different things about when a credit report can be used. So for example, states like California, Illinois, Maryland, and Vermont have statutes that set out the specific positions for which an employer can run a credit report. On the other hand, Washington states that an employer can rely on credit reports if the credit information is quote unquote substantially job related or required by law. And what this means for those of you operating in Washington is that you're left to determine whether credit history information bears any relationship to the specific job in question. Vermont, which is the latest state to enact a credit check law, is interesting in that it is the first state to state that while credit reports or history can be used for certain positions, that same information cannot be the sole factor in the employment decision. Now, how this will work in practice is unclear at this time, but it is the only state that we are aware of that has this restriction. Some of these states also require the employer to provide specific disclosures to the applicant regarding the basis for obtaining the credit information. So for example, one of the exclusions in California is for individuals uh, who work in a financial institution. And so if a California employer decides to obtain a credit report for an individual um, under any of the exemptions, the employer must notify the applicant which exemptions they fit within so that the applicant can understand why a credit report is being used. Now we are aware that legislation restricting the use of credit history for employment purposes is pending in other states like New York and Rhode Island. And while the EEOC was expected to issue updated guidance regarding credit history information on April 25th, the same day it issued the criminal history guidance, it didn't do so given the controversy surrounding the criminal records guidance. 
the next slide will talk about uh, restrictions on criminal records, um, particularly in the city of Philadelphia, Massachusetts, and Hawaii, as well as Indiana. Um, now, as mentioned earlier, there's a federal bill pending that would prohibit employers from asking for criminal history information on an employment application. The city of Philadelphia, Massachusetts, and Hawaii um, have that same restriction, and we are aware that there is similar legislation pending in New York. Indiana has a new law, effective July 1, 2013, which restricts information that consumer reporting agencies or your background screening companies can provide to you. Under the law, criminal history providers or background screening companies that obtain criminal history information from the state can only provide you with information pertaining to criminal convictions. The law also states that criminal history providers will no longer be permitted to provide certain information in background reports that you receive, such as an infraction, an arrest, or a charge that did not result in a conviction or a record that has been expunged. So employers in Indiana have to recognize that when they receive a criminal background check from a criminal history provider, they might not be getting the entire picture on the particular applicant. The law also provides that residents of Indiana with restricted or sealed criminal records can legally state on an employment application that they have not been adjudicated, arrested, or convicted of the offense um, recorded in the restricted records. And employers also in Indiana will be prohibited from asking an employee about sealed and restricted criminal records. The next slide will discuss the Massachusetts Criminal Offender Records Information Statute, which although it's been on the books for a while, um, has become a, a, a hot topic because some of the key provisions only became effective recently. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, in Massachusetts, employers cannot ask about criminal history information on an employment application, but must wait until after a conditional offer has been made. But there also are new obligations for those of you operating in Massachusetts that use criminal records for employment purposes. Um, before uh, you question an applicant about their criminal history, um, that the applicant must be provided with a copy of the criminal records, um, provided that the employer has the records in its possession. But the employer also must do the same thing before taking an adverse action against the applicant based on their criminal history. And this is somewhat similar to the existing requirement under the federal FCRA that before taking adverse action um, on information from a background check report, uh, the employer has to provide the applicant with a pre-adverse action notice, which includes a copy of the background check report and a summary of rights. Now, another new requirement in Massachusetts is that it is for employers that conduct more than five background check reports per year must have a quote-unquote criminal offender record information policy. Now, the contents of the policy will vary depending on whether the employer obtains criminal records directly from the Department of Criminal Justice Information Services, also called ICORI, or whether the background screening company will obtain the criminal information uh, using courthouse searches. Now, in our experience, most employers do not obtain criminal history from the DCJIS or ICORI because of the administrative requirements associated with using that database. database. Either way, at a minimum, the policy must notify the applicant of the potential for an adverse decision based on criminal records. It also must notify the applicant that if adverse action is taken against him or her, the company will provide the criminal history records to the applicant along with the policy. And the policy also must state that um, it will provide the applicant with information concerning the process for correcting criminal records. Now that last form is actually a form that's on the DCJIS a website. It's about a one-page form, but it does contain detailed information for an applicant if they have issues with their criminal history. So the bottom line is that employers in Massachusetts have to be mindful of these new requirements um, when obtaining background checks that contain criminal history, especially if you're um, doing more than five um, reports per year. I'll turn it back over to Rod to talk about negligent hiring. So. One way to think about this whole area of background checks from a high level is you have the, the folks with an interest in keeping the criminals out of the workplace, and then you have groups, some of them you know, with very laudable objectives of trying to help people who have made bad decisions uh, or been caught up in something that they didn't really know what they were getting into, helping those folks get back into the workplace. And the those interests can really be in tension with each other, and that's one of the reasons it makes this uh, a complicated area of the law, because employers working through the problems have to consider them from the many different dimensions. 
uh, including from a kind of a basic standpoint is, hey, we don't want the EEOC to give us a hard time, and at the same time, we don't want to get sued for hiring someone we know is a criminal who then goes on to do something bad to a customer or whatever. Um, one way some of the states have been trying to make the, that decision-making a little bit easier for the employers um, is to create basically a help in a negligence case. And so Ohio is one of the latest states to do that, and, and there are not very many, I will tell you. But the idea is to basically give you some protection in a negligent hiring case in certain circumstances where you hire someone with a criminal background. And so this law will go into effect uh, at the end of September, and it does give you a measure of protection, or at least the, the statute on its face, because statutes have to be interpreted by courts who sometimes come up with interpretations that you may scratch your head over, uh, that would give you protection um, in the event that you did hire someone with a criminal record who had one of these certificates, uh, and they went on to do something that got you into some sort of negligence case. Now, these laws are imperfect in a lot of ways um, because they may not consider all the different circumstances where these problems can come up. So the most simple and real-life illustration of that is, uh, and somewhat ironically, the situation where you have someone who, let's say, commits some sexual misconduct against coworkers, and maybe you don't end up in a tort suit where the statute might help you, but actually you have the EEOC saying that you are responsible for the sexual harassment. And I've, I've seen those cases raised by the EEOC, and um, you can see how it's kind of inconsistent for them to take the position that someone's criminal past can be used against you when at the same time they're out there very publicly saying to hire ex-criminals, but um, that's the government for you. So these laws are useful. There's not very many of them, and it's important to understand that they offer some protection, but not necessarily protection on all the different fronts that employers sometimes find themselves fighting the battles. Oops. So to kind of give you the summary of where we are with the state law, uh, and this is particularly important for multi-state employers who are stuck not only with the federal law but having to deal with the patchwork of different laws at the, at the state level, and not all states have laws that touch on the fair credit reporting process or protect ex-criminals or people with bad credit, but a number of them do, and it's important if you're a multi-state employer or have operations in one of these states to understand the differences and keep an idea on which new states are joining the bad wagon. So number one is make sure you know the state laws uh, that protect people. So for example, California, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, those states tend to be very active uh, in terms of claims basically by ex-criminals saying you shouldn't have held my criminal record against me. Make sure in the states uh, where you're using credit reports, which may be, for example, only where you have your corporate office or the like, that you're paying attention to um, this trend, which will, in my view, continue um, of states restricting not only when you can use the credit reports, but what you have to tell people before you can use them. And so the California law is, is the best illustration of that. Uh, make sure you're taking a look at your application and your sequencing of when this information is being elicited from your applicants because this ban the box sort of movement of keeping these questions off the application. I, I don't know if the federal law is going to get anywhere with the state that Capitol Hill is in, but I expect we will see some, some states enacting similar laws to what we've already seen in a couple of jurisdictions. Uh, have a good sense of the type of records that you're getting from uh, higher right. Um, so you have folks who are what we call the SME and, and can help you as you uh, try to look for opportunities to fortify your compliance at your organization. And if you're in Massachusetts, um, we, this is a pressing issue for Massachusetts employer, and, and the compliance, especially if you're not getting records from the DCJS, is not all that complicated, but I'm sure uh, someone has to be the first test case in Massachusetts, and you know we would like to help you uh, avoid uh, being the poster child for non-compliance. Um, we're going to ask our higher right representative to come in here and tell you a little bit about the great materials and information that higher right makes available for you. Thank you, Rod. 
As Rod said, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to discuss the channels and tools that we utilize here at HireRate to provide compliance updates to our customers. So at, at Higher Aid, compliance information is delivered by the experts in Higher Aid's legal department, and we also collaborate with Littler Mendelson, like we're doing today. Uh, Littler Mendelson, as Rob stated earlier, is one of the nation's largest labor and employment firms, and they continuously monitor legal and regulatory changes, and this just helps individuals maintain a compliance screening program because they're continuously kept apprised of what's happening in legislation and background screening. Higher rate customers also receive regular legal alerts, which include summaries, FAQs, and proactive notifications of upcoming changes in the legislative landscape. We also provide our customers with any notifications on new or updated compliance tools that are now available to them. Our customers also have access to webinars, like the one we're doing today, and also quarterly newsletters to keep them informed of what's going on. At HireRate, we've also created a tool called Compliance Central. Compliance Central is an online tool that provides a breadth of screening-related information. So if our, one of our customers logs into Compliance Central, they'll find legislative alerts and articles, they'll find federal and state legal summaries, and we also have industry-specific summaries for certain, for certain industries. You'll also find legislative reports, forms, as well as educational materials. So really, it's a one-stop shop for our customers to get online and to see what's going on in the compliance world. Compliance Central is integrated with two of our screening platforms here at Higher Rate. So this just provides another avenue of instant access for our customers to find out what's going, in, going on in changing legislation. If you want, you can also subscribe to legislative alerts and updates via an RSS web feed. So that is an overview of the compliance tools we use here at Higher Rate for our customers. Before we end our presentation, I'm going to hand it back over to Rod, who is going to leave you with some parting thoughts. So to, to make this as basic as possible, um, paying attention will yield a lot of dividends here in terms of avoiding problems. And so the starting point for that is keeping an eye on what's going on. Um, a, a simple way or a practical way to think about all the different stuff we're talking about is to break it down into two pieces. One is what we call the infrastructure. That's the things like I have to get consent before I order a background check on a job applicant. And it's basically uh, – the super highway that your decisions are going to drive down. And we are seeing a lot of activity there, and particularly in the class action arena. So even though it seems like the technical part of this, you know, the, the foundation for the decisions, but not the decisions themselves, it is really important to keep an eye on what's going on there. Then there's the decision making. And that's basically the, you know, what do you do with this information once you, um, once it comes into your hands? And there's a lot going on there, too, and you will really benefit, I think, from having thoughtful discourse or discussion in your organization about how your company is handling the information. And some, some of the questions are really basic. Uh, Jen and I were talking to a client yesterday about their screening program, and we went over the things like uh, kind of the fundamentals that, that are worth reviewing with your team. You know, who's getting the information? Um, how are they going about deciding what to do with it? How are the decisions being recorded? Uh, those are kind of the basics, and, and it's a very good time given all the things we're seeing um, in terms of the EEOC and the FCRA and the CFPB and all the other different alphabet soup acronyms that are suddenly coming off the pages of some dry legal treatise to, to be real issues for employers to grapple with. Um, you will benefit from bringing the right people together to have a discussion about how your organization is accommodating all of these different competing considerations. So on behalf of Littler, uh, we um, appreciate the opportunity that Higher Rights uh, provided for us to prevent you with this information, and um, you will all be better off for spending the time going through this today.